maybe we first say hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. It's very, very nice to look into your faces, at least virtually, and to meet in two weeks physically. That is really very exciting news that it's it's happening. We are very glad. This is Jürgen. Good morning. And I'm Elizabeth. And we'll see each other in two weeks. And today we talk about the upcoming event. And thank you, Spoon and Busi, very, very much for organizing it in uh, South Africa. This is really a wonderful occasion uh, to bring Jazz Against Apartheid home and that you made it happen. Thank you very, very much. And all of you to participate. Thank you. Yes. Do you want to start? Yeah. So I think let's let's hand over to uh, Christopher to get us started uh, with the discussion. Okay. Yeah, would be great. Also, thanks from my side. It's fantastic that you make this project happen. Uh, um, it, it's really fantastic. I'm very very sad I can't come in person to South Africa. I would have loved to do it. I hope I can do it next time. It was just because everything was a little bit uh, short notice and so, so that's why I had other tours planned. But um, it's great that I can participate now in this way. I'm at the moment in Paris, in the Cité des Arts. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to answer your questions. Um, so maybe it would be best that you just start with a question and then I can um, unfold on, on that. Fantastic. Christopher, we, we wish to know um, your history with Jazz Against Apartheid, how you came to join Jazz Against Apartheid, and uh, the role you've played with the event. Yes. Um, actually, I, I was first uh, uh, part of that program when there was a workshop. And um, if I don't remember right, then I hope that Jürgen and Elisabeth can help me out if I maybe get the dates wrong or something. But I think it was in the 90s, beginning of 90s or something that I was uh, there at a workshop um, about John Diani and uh, Jazz Gig against Apartheid. And I was very interested because um, always as a young person, I uh, I thought that, that music and politics politics are connected. <laughs> um, uh, it was more an intuitive um, question, but today I think it's because uh, for me, politics is about negotiating how we live together and create spaces for living together. And uh, since in that respect also, space is not only a neutral given, <clears throat> a street, a building, uh, a city, but its space is very much about what people do um, with with special constellations, do with with a building, do with a street, and so on. And this way, of doing things together is what also the political philosopher, German philosopher Hans Arendt, has called acting concept. Is for me. Uh, very much ingrained also in the way how how we make music and there are different ways of making music together and that's always part of then negotiating how to do that and in that respect uh, this John Didiani project was quite um, yeah interesting for me and revealing and through that participating in the workshop I then got to know the people who organize it the Jürgen and so on and then later on I was then invited to also participate as a player and I don't know when I was playing for the first time with the project it must have been also in the 90s I think late 90s or something and it was quite an experience for me because at the time um, yeah uh, Johnny um, there was a John Shikai uh, with a band and um, it was Harry Beckett with a band my co my Kaya anyway, and so it was uh, very touching and moving to, to work with players that hand on the tradition 
um, firsthand because it's always, you know, since we are talking, we, are, we will talk probably about the notation, but we will also talk about an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, oral tradition is uh, on one hand that you um, kind of um, transmit the knowledge through talking, but not only that, it's also about uh, doing. Um, because if, if, if they have already played with Johnny Diani, then they have ingrained, inscribed in their body. This, this experience is inscribed as an archive, a knowledge in the body which for that music. And so playing with them and to be part of the archive or becoming part of, of, of the archive. And um, yeah. that was really, really um, unbel an unbelievable experience for me and uh, still yeah, resonates with me today. No, wonderful. Uh, Christopher, um, in terms of uh, the vibes playing, how would you say the, the vibes playing um, you know, uh, mixes with the Diani compositions. I mean, is it suitable for vibes playing? And then also on that, you know, how about your experience as a vibes player? I mean, could you add value to to assisting the guitarists and the pianists that uh, perform these compositions in the future? Absolutely. Um, what was interesting that as far as I remember, and Elizabeth and Jürgen, you correct me when I'm 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 wrong, but as far as remember as I remember, when I came to the band, there was no harmony instrument. Mm -hmm. No harmony instrument, mm -hmm. and that makes total sense because the music of Giannini is very much bass oriented. And um, the, the, the musicologist, um, Peter Niklas Wilson, he at, at a symposium in the 90s also gave a lecture on, on this um, very peculiar way of, 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 of composing. And um, this comp composing means that you work with ostinato structure. And the ostinato structure, in in Johnny Diaz also in itself peculiar because uh, one side the, the, the ostinato allows you to um, proceed rhythmically in a static harmonic condition means that uh, the ostinato moves but for example the the the, the harmony can then stay stable like what you call also modal, modal harmony. And um, when you see, for example, when you compare it to Debussy or, or Ravel in the European tradition of modal composing, it's a quite static also rhythmically, you'd say. But in, 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 in uh, the African uh, way of doing it, and also especially in the Johnny Diani way of doing it, it's you, you, you use that statics to pump pump the rhythm and um, that gives the static harmony uh, um, uh, um, dynamic 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 and so it was totally clear that when when I came to the band it was totally functioning without harmony instrument you don't you don't need it what you need is a strong strong bass and strong drums and then the, the 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 saxophone and trumpet and so on would 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 maneuver all on top of that, uh, and that I mean this is important as a background of how to approach the music. That meant that at first actually I refrained from from playing harmonies at all. So so to get into the music to do the research and to find out how it's working. So what I would do was rather to complement. The melody with the with the color of of the vibraphone. So to have it blend with the trumpet or the saxophone, and in that sense, you know, give, give that a certain overtone overtone structure, which is which works very nicely 
with the base ostinato, the specific base ostinati of um, of Johnny Diani. And uh, then just later, I, I kind of found out how to do it. And I think what I really like about the vibraphone that it, in that sense, it uh, has two things. One thing is that it's very rhythmically, it's um, like a bala phone or you, um, or you have the marimba phone. Also, in, um, for example, and I saw a lot of um, marimba phone uh, ensembles in, um, in Mozambique, for example, uh, that has a certain power uh, and body uh, embodiment of playing. I think there's not any melodic harmonic instrument that has that body power. Because if you have a piano, you don't even see do. And also, if you play um, saxophone or trumpet, you you don't see actually the, what's happening. You see the guys are playing, but you don't see what's happening. In a vibraphone, <laughs> you see what you get, and it's projecting really uh, like that, and it's, it's, it has that punch. And uh, that what that was very, I think, uh, worked very well with Johnny Gianni compositions. On the one thing, the other thing with vibraphone is that it has only four notes at the same time. I am very restricted in the harmonic um, space, the musical space, because sometimes with when you have piano players, they can play 10 uh, notes time. And I think for the Johnny Diano music, that would be just too full. I mean, it would, it's possible, but I would recommend also to piano players and guitar players to use less notes when harmonizing the music because it's very much about the space that uh, the of John Diani uh, creates. It's, it, now that's a very difficult for me to explain. It's an experience. It has a huge space. Hmm. I mean, and maybe that's also connecting to the landscape of South Africa. I've been there a couple of times. Uh, it has a vast landscape uh, compared to uh, European landscape, which is more this narrow. And for me, this was vast. And this vastness is very much inscribed for me in that in that music. And uh, that's why it's important if you use the harmony to uh, in that case, less is more. And um, especially it for the for the for the music that has references to the traditional um, choir uh, music that John Vian is exposed to, it's very important to to maybe more or less stick to the threads that are in K. Yeah. Well, thanks, Christopher. Just a final question from me is, um, you know, uh, Johnny was a self-taught mu musician, so I don't know. If you pick up any aspects of um, him being self-taught in, in the way uh, you, you have approached the music or experienced the music. Actually, I don't make, uh, I don't distinguish between self-taught and not self-taught. I think there exists only self-taught music, even though, there are academies and so on. Because um, you always have to do it yourself. I think that, that counts actually for me, just in my approach for every learning. I think it's a complete misconception um, that there is an institution that has a container and the container is then put into the people that learn. Um, I think we live on the planet together. And as, as long as I live on the planet, I am exposed to situations and I learn. And there are different learning settings, probably. But it's clear to me that, that, that John Giani is also music that took up the experience of being on the planet. <laughs> in uh, different uh, conditions, being exposed to different contexts. And uh, I'm, that's what I always felt with Johnny Adiani, that is very, very heterogeneous 
uh, heterogeneous in the context it um, it works with. For example, if you uh, take, take these uh, tunes like Appear or o ODF, uh, which are very much uh, structured more in the, what I would say, South African way of, of, of moving the harmony and the melody. And others like a Song for My Father or uh, are very much informed by the hot pop movement. And at the time, um, Diane also played hot pop and uh, this jazz uh, oriented um, material that's, that's in, in inscribed in, in his music too. And uh, so that, that would be for me the, the way to approach the music. And since I have also mentioned this, Steve Pico, I think, and that's probably something also Jürgen will talk, talk later, is that, um, that these, and that's an argument for my learning by being exposed to situations is that John Diani would name um, his tunes uh, situation um, that could be person mm -hmm. that for example Steve Biko um, that could be an organization like the UDF it could be his father it could be the situation of that something appears um, that, that, I think that's very important the, the, the music is always related to, to that experience and that can project uh, in the music. So, uh, for example, I'm, uh, when I was at school, a high school, I, the, 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 there was a, um, a bookstore in, in, in Germany and they had a German translation of a Steve Biko book. I don't know actually what the original title was, but the... German title was Ich schreibe was mir passt. <laughs> and that book I immediately bought because I thought that's exactly what I want to do too. Um, I want to write what I like. And that's for me inscribed music of Steve, uh, I mean, in music of John Diani very much. You know, that's this empower, uh, empowerment. I do, I like no matter, um, you know, if people say you can do this, you can't do that, I will, I will do it, I will pull through. And that um, has, a, I think, also very political power and has a power that can inspire the people who play it, but also the people who listen to that music. Mm -hmm. And that's why it has a high political relevance still today, um, I, I think. Thank you so very, very much, um, Christopher. We do hope uh, you, you play with South Africans again. I don't know if anybody has a question in the audience. I also want to welcome Vukile and Sipukazi who've joined us. Does anyone have a question for, for Christopher at this stage? No. No. Not yet. Then I think... Uh, Maybe we can we can hand over to Jürgen uh, to carry on. Oh, sorry, Stron. Um, may I ask uh, one question or comment, perhaps, from yes. my side? Um, uh, Christopher, you mentioned something about the archive, and mm -hmm. just that uh, 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 highlighted the importance of sound as the actual archive for me, especially in our historiographies. Um, your work with Yanni, how important do you think that is specifically in relation to the archive? Uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is a mm, very interesting question. Mm. I mean, I can, for myself, I can speak, this has a very high relevance because it has 
very very much um, informed my my playing and my way of moving about the make, making making music and understanding the the, the making of music um, but probably you also ask uh, the relevance of the archive in a general way. There, it's, it's very difficult for me to say because that um, also touches upon the, the medium or the question of medium and how far can a medium. So I was talking about archive that was inscribed in the body. So that for me was very important to be in contact then with uh, John Chica and Harry Beckett, for example, but also Luis Moholo and Akai Choco, who had that archive inscribed in their body and they could then um, give me access to that. Um, but it's clear that the medium of the body has a very short range of influence. Um, that's that's the, something I don't even know how to tackle that. That means that the relevance for me is then also when only when I'm playing for the people, I can uh, expose that what I have lived or experienced in that archive of Johnny Diani. Um, but what is missing a little bit, I think, and what that is great now, for example, is that Johnny Diani songbook, which is now created, which is then the medium of the notation as a book, as a PDF, um, that can reach then more people and they can then also have access to that and, and play it and invent their own ways of, of doing it. And that's that's one one thing. And the other thing is that since the music is so open, I mean, it's 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 really different from um, from um, classical European uh, composition that has where everything is written out and you have to stick to everything that's written. Yeah. You know, I think what is uh, great about the composition of Johnny Diani, it's one page. Um, most of the time, it's even half a page. So the archive one is exposed to is thing that can be um, continued. That's, that's what, what these compositions are made for, that they can be continued, that can, that, that can be actualized, and that every one of you who plays and uh, participates in the workshop, and then will also later play this music, will highly personalize this archive. And I think that's a fantastic, Fantastic thing. Was that in that direction or? Most definitely, most definitely and more. I also like the fact that you touched on the process of continuation and uh, um, how specifically lucky you were uh, um, just to be amongst uh, uh, the your musical peers such as uh, uh, Louis Moholo and of Dato Johnny Gianni as well. And also the fact that you mentioned that music is a medium, or oh, sorry, the body, it can be a medium of archive, it, archival itself. So uh, those are very important aspects, I think, also which touch on perhaps the memoirs or the memory bank of a, a musician to be mm -hmm. sort of like, the a, a reservoir mm -hmm. of an archive, especially with uh, uh, each per, each musician's lived experience. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christopher. Can we hand over to Elizabeth and Jürgen? Yes. Thank you. So. Uh, Stuart, do you want this first question to put the first question out, or shall I? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Jürgen, we have a little interview now. 
Uh, what is the history, your history with jazz against the party? Um, yeah, uh, it's a, so many things. In Spain, I can't even have a concert. Why a concert is soon and difficult? The concert was really soon and also anti apartheid division. Okay, I will translate uh, because I have the feeling that everyone is fluent in German. Am I correct? So I will translate what he said. He said, um, Jazz Against Apartheid first is connected to the space, to the place and space, <laughs> taking up your word, uh, Christopher, of Frankfurt. The city of Frankfurt is known as a, as a city in Germany of banks and of um, the trade place where the buzz is. I don't know how you call that. So it is very much connected to being here in Frankfurt and Frankfurt as a city of banks being a place that supported apartheid, that gave credits to the apartheid system, money and finances. Yeah, that's a that is a city of filler action. Gegen die Banken, Menschen, Teppiche für die Deutschen Bank, aber eben auch Boykott, durch den Boykott, Aufforderung kauft keine Früchte aus Südafrika, die Aufforderung macht keine Geschäfte mit Südafrika. So that's why here in Frankfurt, during the anti-apartheid movement in general, in Germany and Europe, Frankfurt was a center of anti-apartheid um, action. For example, carpets of human beings lying out in front of banks, yeah, or boycotting fruits from coming from South Africa to make clear that we do not want to make any business with the apartheid regime. Yeah, das, uh, and the Bewegung wurde getragen im Wesentlichen als Beschuss von Gewerkschaften, von Kirchen und von Kulturzentren. Mm -hmm. And this anti-apartheid movement here, not only, but also very much in Frankfurt, was supported by unions, by trade unions, by churches, especially the Protestant church, and by cultural centers, people engaged in, in arts, in music, etc. Dazu kommt noch ein wichtiger Beitrag von Frankfurt. Frankfurt ist, wie gesagt, von der Struktur her vielleicht ähnlich wie die Hamburg, aber auch deshalb, weil Frankfurt auch eine Jazzstadt ist. Seit etwa 100 Jahren hat der Jazz in Frankfurt eine Existenz. Also, it is good to know that Frankfurt is a center of jazz in Germany. For the last 100 years, it has been a center of jazz, just like Johannesburg. And there's a link between Johannesburg and Frankfurt. Not only in this respect, but also in this musical aspect. Und vielleicht noch ein letzter Aspekt, der auch wichtig ist, also jedenfalls aus meiner Sicht, das ist, äh, äh, dass es äh, äh, sich auch sehr eng für uns verbunden mit der Geschichte des deutschen Exils. Seit äh, Jahrhunderten leben Deutsche im Exil und äh, sie haben im Exil ihre Arbeit verrichtet und sind im Exil gestorben. Ich denke an Georg Büchner. An Heinrich Heine, an, äh, ja, an Karl Marx, an Bertolt Brecht. Und das ist, glaube ich, noch ein wichtiger Teil natürlich auch von Anfang an gewesen, dass für uns die Exilerfahrung ja ein Teil unserer Geschichte ist. Okay, I just read the chat from um, you that you cannot hear us very well. I think I will put on the headset and um, translate. I hope that you hear me better then, okay? Is it better now? Can you hear me better now? Yeah? A lot better, a lot better. Much better, okay. Good, so what he just said was that a very important aspect to him is that um, South Africa is very much linked to our German exile history. Very many important intellectuals and, and uh, artists and people emigrated and left Germany 
um, because of the political conditions. And this is a very important connection to him. Many people like Georg Büchner or Heinrich Heine or uh, Brecht emigrated. And this exile subject is something which we find again in Jazz Against Apartment, that musicians being here in exile because of the situation in South Africa, which did not allow them to um, be together as people should be together. So this exile subject, I, I must underline, is very, very important to Jordan and this shared history of, of exile. Okay. Okay. How did you meet Johnny? Ja, der Grund war erstmal, dass wir einen eigenen Beitrag als Projekt für Schönen Ghetto, einen eigenen Beitrag in Frankfurt leisten wollten, also nicht nur an den Aktionen beteiligt sein, sondern einen kulturellen Beitrag. Und dazu wollten wir natürlich äh, die Ästhetik der Musik aus Südafrika kennenlernen. Okay. Um Being, as I just uh, explained, uh, having Frankfurt as a center of anti-apartheid movement, Kultur im Ghetto, which is our association, uh, which hosts concerts, etc., in, in certain spaces in, in Frankfurt and beyond, wanted to contribute um, individually to this anti-apartheid movement by staging concerts and by presenting the aesthetics of South African jazz. Uh, and this is why he and, and uh, others from Kutu and Ghetto got in contact with Johnny Diani, uh, asking him if he could um, imagine being a part uh, of this jazz against apartheid project. Yeah, uh, an aspect came that we were from Kutu and Ghetto was noisy, while we heard that dass die Südafrikaner eben sagen, der Jazz kommt ja nicht alleine aus den USA. Seine Wurzeln sind nicht nur in Amerika. Das fanden wir spannend und interessant. A very important aspect was that uh, musicians like Johnny uh, said, well, Jazz doesn't originate uh, only in the US, in the United States of America. It comes from South Africa as well. And this is something which Kultur im Ghetto picked up on and thought very um, interesting to lay open, to undig the, the other roots of jazz and to have them presented very prominently in, uh, in this music. Ja, dann äh, gab es natürlich eine Reihe von Namen. Wir wussten, es gibt Kusner Kreuzer, es gibt Mohoro, es gibt Johnny Diani äh, und Kuswana beispielsweise. Aber wir haben eben äh, Interesse an Johnny Diani gehabt, weil er vielleicht der unangepassteste, der unbequemste von den Musikern ist. Okay. Yes, and uh, so they thought, well, who to approach from the South African community, musicians community? There was Chris McGregor, uh, there was Louis Moholo, there was Louis Pukwana, but uh, they thought Johnny was probably the least comfortable person, the least uh, adjusted person, the most, the freest spirit, I would say. Um, and that's why they approached Johnny uh, to ask if we could think of collaborating in this jazz and interpretation. Yeah, and then we tried to meet him, to speak. There was a lot of concerts in Frankfurt, with his own group, with the group of Pierre Dorge, and also Solo-Beiträge. Auch als aufgetreten bei Lila im Park, das war eine große Open Air Veranstaltung mit tausenden Leuten. And so um, they wanted to get in contact with Johnny. Uh, Johnny was performing here with his own group, with his own band. He was performing with Pierre Jorge. Um, he was performing solo. He was performing with a, at a big concert here in Frankfurt called Lila im Park, which is uh, songs in the park. And um, this is the way they approached him. Ja, wir haben dabei natürlich auch Johnny's äh, Humor, seinen oft sarkastischen Humor kennengelernt. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> he said, this is the way they also encountered and met with Johnny's humor. His sense of humor, his sometimes 
sarcastic sense of humor. Ja, und wir haben dann aber auch gemeinsam. Ich sage dann, was das war, was das sarkastisch war, was das ja. war. Also, äh, zum Beispiel, wir sind ja eine Initiative, keine Institution. Wir hatten jetzt schon kein Geld und so, das haben wir natürlich erstmal gesagt. Mhm. Und da haben wir gesagt, ach, das macht gar nichts, dann spielen wir eine Viertelstunde. Und dann scheint auch das Geld da ist, dann spielen wir noch eine Viertelstunde. Yeah. Just as an example of his sense of humor, um, when Jürgen introduced himself as Kultur im Ghetto, he said, we are not a big institution, we are just a small initiative, and we don't have money, we don't have much money at all. And <laughs> Johnny Diani said, well, uh, no problem, so we play for 15 minutes, and if you collect another little bit of money, we play for another 15 minutes, and if you collect more money, we play for another 15 minutes. So this is the way he answered this this approach. Aber wir fanden dann eben auch zusammen, wir fanden auch diesen Namen Fest gegen Apartheid zusammen. Das war ein deutscher Name, weil das ganze Projekt natürlich für Frankfurt zunächst mal gedacht war. And so they did finally end up together in this project also with the name Jazz gegen Apartheid, a German name, because it was directed towards a German audience. Hier in Frankfurt, based in Frankfurt. That's why we never had an international approach, thinking um, it could go to the US, it could go to Africa, it could go to wherever. So, mm -hmm. yeah. just Frankfurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, now um, this is an exile question he likes. Why do you think South Africa as a country has not yet celebrated um, the great exilees like um, Johnny Diani, even 25 years after freedom, or more? It's more than 25 years now. Yeah, we are stützen uns aber auf die auf die deutschen Erfahrungen auf und weil die Überzeugung ist, dass die Besten eines Landes wenn die Bedingungen eben schlecht sind, wie im Apartheid-Staat, dass die Besten des Landes aus dem Landes gehen, ins Exil gehen. Mm -hmm. um, he thinks, uh, he says, well, we base this um, assumption that it is uh, this, this recognition that uh, exilees are not uh, welcome and not um, applauded more in, in South Africa. This is very much an experience we have in Germany as well. Um, and it's it's a shared experience, once again, between South Africa and Germany. And he says, it, what he finds is that um, if conditions are bad um, for, for people, if the political conditions are awful, it's usually the best people who leave a country and who um, have their works um, done in, not in the country they leave, but in exile. Is it still difficult to hear me? Yes? It's okay. Because I just got a news that someone is still no, no, it's, it's okay, we do, we're doing our best. Okay, okay. Ja, und äh, im Exil ist es natürlich so, dass diese Menschen auch große Werke schaffen. Das ist nicht nur bei Johnny Diani so, sondern das gilt natürlich genauso für Marolo, das gilt für Mottega, das gilt für das Kritiker Damas. Also sie haben äh, ein großes Werk geschaffen, aber auch andere Wissenschaftler, äh, wie äh, Ludwig Alexander zum Beispiel als Pädagoge oder eben Lucy Kuno als Poet, ja. Also wir hatten ganz viele äh, wunderbare Leute hier im Exil, die uns natürlich auch hören, zuhören gewählt haben. He says, um, it's that people who go into exile um, very often create marvelous works in exile, in those conditions under exile. And Lucy is an example of that. He, as a poet, he created works here in exile. It is uh, Louis Mopolo who created works, Voodoo who created works. And um, not just musicians, not just artists, also political um, involved people like Neville Alexander. They do, under the conditions of exile, they do 
and create wonderful works. And they teach us what he said, they teach us to listen. And this is why they are so very helpful and fruitful for our societies as well. For the societies in which these exiles live. Ja, und dann äh, war ja klar, also der Kampf gegen Apartheid, wie er hier in Frankfurt auch gekämpft wurde, er zeigte ja Erfolge. Äh, es gab die Anzeichen, dass die Apartheid zu Ende gehen könnte. In Namibia ist das schon früher passiert, als in Südafrika selbst. Und viele äh, im Exil haben sich natürlich die Frage gestellt, Heimkehr oder Exil? He says, well, this fight against apartheid was successful in the end, in Namibia earlier than, than in South Africa. Um, and many artists and people in exile ask themselves, well, what do we do? Do we stay in our exile countries or do we return home? Like Lucy, like Peggy Muswazi, um, like many others. Ja, und äh, als die Reise dann anstand, es sind ja viele vorgegangen, da hat äh, Neville Alexander gesagt, wundere dich nicht, wenn jetzt mit uns das Gleiche passiert, was die Deutschen äh, erfahren haben, als sie aus dem Exil zurückkamen. And when the question came up, returning or staying, Neville Alexander, a South African uh, political scientist, he said to Jürgen, Jürgen, don't be astonished if now uh, what will happen in South Africa will be more or less the same um, as what happened in Germany, that the ones who are, went into exile are not welcome when they come home to their home countries. This is an experience that German intellectuals, artists made when they had to leave Germany during the Nazi period, when they returned, they were looked upon with very, very much suspicion, to say the least. Not just suspicion, but outright rejection. Ja, das war erstmal so die, äh, das Zitat des Übrigens, Heim Keller Lexi, stand von Klaus Mann, und der Sohn von Thomas Mann. Und wir haben das dann abgewandelt bei Test gegen Apartheid in den Ländern. Test gegen Apartheid ist ein Projekt zwischen Heimkehr und Exil. The project um, Jazz Against Apartheid, um, no, I'm sorry, the quote to return or to stay is a quote by a German author called Klaus Mann. He is the son of Thomas Mann, maybe you have heard of him. Um, and we have changed this um, to saying between returning and staying in exile. It is not a question, but it's that situation in between, which is not quite, uh, you're not quite home at home and you're not quite home in your exile country, but you're in, in an existence in between because of the experiences that people in exile have any questions in between? <laughs> or was it crystal clear? <laughs> Can I please ask a question? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, we earlier. Um, Chris uh, was talking about an archive. I think, I think that Jagen is, you know, a, a, a living archive, you know, uh, and uh, it is through people like him that uh, will continue to be forever indebted to the people of Germany and the world who fought side by side with us to end apartheid. But uh, what I wanted to ask, <clears throat> as I'm researching, this is a, a strange coincidence because I am, I'm actually writing an essay as, as part of a book that I've been researching for a while now, where I'm trying to juxtapose the lives of Steve Biko and the life of um, Johnny Gianni. Mm -hmm. But as I was doing my research, I discovered that uh, at a time in East Berlin, where the ANC was based, there was a, a fellow called uh, Cindy Somfenyane. Uh, I wanted to find out to what extent um, did the ANC had a role or influence uh, 
uh, in the chairs against apartheid. But on a more humane note, I wanted to know as well, he mentioned the Johnny and his sense of humor, but I want him to dwell more on a portrait of Johnny. What kind of a person was he other than the humor, you know, was a compassionate person, revolutionary, angry, bitter, you know, having been separated with his people for many years. Perhaps if you can just go more on the personality, you know, I mean, being a, a South African and I live in East London, a city where Johnny Kiani was born, you know, it'll be nice to kind of get a sense of, of a portrait, even if it's a rough sketch of the kind of person that we are talking about. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me translate. You know, uh, die Frage ist, was für einen Einfluss hat er auf die AfD, auf Jazz against the Party, ganz generell? Und was ihr aber noch oder ihm sehr wichtig ist, ist, was für eine Person war denn eigentlich? Also, weil du eben diesen Humor erwähnt hast. Mhm. War er ein verbitterter Revolutionär? War er fröhlich? War er, wie war er als Person? Willst du vielleicht darauf zu öffnen? Ja, also für mich der, der, der MC war natürlich auch in Deutschland präsent. Ich erinnere nur eine große Veranstaltung hier wieder im Park mit Johnny, das war also mit Susi Kavali, der eine Rede gehalten hat und auch Johnny eingeführt hat als Musiker. Und in einem brillanten Deutsch, den Johnny Vianney gelobt hat, wirklich wunderschwer geschildert hat. Also insofern war der ANC natürlich präsent. Auf der anderen Seite gerade natürlich auch gerade von den äh, Leuten hier im Exil wirklich Rückmeldungen, dass sie sich gesagt haben, diese Organisation vertut vielleicht zu wenig, äh, was die Perspektive der Rückkehr betrifft. Mhm. Ähm, die äh, Jürgen Menschens Kwesi Kadali, who was uh, from the ANC, and he was um, introducing Johnny Diani at this big concert here in Frankfurt, I had mentioned earlier, Lieder in Park, Songs in the Park. And he introduced him brilliantly, not only in the sense that his German was perfect, but that he captured Johnny's personality in a brilliant way, he said. Um, so the ANC was present here, not just in East um, Germany, but in West Germany as well. But he said there were people from the scene, from the artistic scene, who said the ANC is not doing enough for us in the prospect, in the respect of the perspective of returning home, of coming home to South Africa. And that there was um, too little engagement in that respect. Ja, vielleicht äh, können wir nur insofern, äh, Johnny selbst war natürlich auch engagiert. Und, ja, äh, äh, ich denke, als Südafrikaner im Exil kann man nicht anders sein als engagiert. Aber er hatte wirklich auch viele, viele äh, Reden gehalten während der Konzerte, um wieder auf das Thema zu sprechen zu kommen. Äh, manche Musiker haben gesagt, es ist besser, wenn er spielt. Er spielt viel besser, als er spricht. Aber es war eben seine Leidenschaft und er hat natürlich auch sehr darunter gelitten, dass er eben von seinem Land so getrennt war. Und das fand ich sein ganzes äh, musikalisches Schaffen war in Europa stattgefunden. Mm -hmm. Jung said, well, Johnny himself was active. Um, he said, as a South African exile, he couldn't be but active in, in a political sense uh, in fighting apartheid from here. And in all the concerts that Jürgen witnessed and that he was with, uh, he said Johnny was um, speaking about the apartheid regime and, and again, speaking out against apartheid. Very often, some, he said, some people said, well, his music is better than his speeches, um, but he couldn't help playing, uh, speaking out against apartheid. So he was very much um, a fighter in a musical sense and in a political rhetorical sense, if you will, against apartheid. Seine besten Reden sind seine Kompositionen. Jürgen says his best speeches are his compositions. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer? And in terms of his personality, in terms of his personality traits, 
you know, what kind of a was he a warm person, you know, other than the sarcastic part that he, he alluded to earlier. If you can just describe him, you know, yeah. Und da war schon seit 86 nach dem ersten Konzertstart schon nicht. Mhm. Also insofern, äh, wenn wir uns getroffen haben, haben wir natürlich meistens über dieses Projekt geredet. Ja. Also ich wusste von seinen Kindern, aber äh, ich wusste, dass er in Skandinavien eine sehr gute Wahl getroffen hat für sein, äh, für sein Leben, für sein musikalisches Wirken, dass er sich ausgesprochen fühlt. Ich wusste, dass er natürlich auch neugierig ist. Er hat ja hier in Europa dann mit ganz vielen anderen Flüchtlingen gearbeitet, mit Afrikanisch aus der Türkei, ja, mit äh, amerikanischen äh, Flüchtlingen, also mit Leuten, die hier in Exil lebten, außerhalb äh, äh, ihres eigenen Landes. Und äh, mit dem hat er ja auch die ganze Zeit musiziert. Er hat wirklich den Kontakt gesucht zu äh, Leuten, die musikalisch äh, etwas Neues wurden und gleichzeitig natürlich auch eine andere Geschichte mitbrachten in diesem Spiel. He says um, he didn't know Johnny Diani for a very long period of time. They met in 85 and in 86, after the first concert of Jazz Against Apartheid in Berlin, he died more or less on stage. So there was not very much time that Jürgen and, and uh, Johnny interacted. Um, But what he knew and what he, he um, got from his personality was that he was a very open and a very curious personality. Uh, curious in the sense that he never stopped um, addressing people who did something new, that he was always on the lookout for something new. People, other exiles here in, in Germany, for example, Turkish musicians and others who were living here, He, he looked for them because they um, had something new to offer. And he was always looking out to learn, to learn more. Yeah. And maybe I can add just a very little episode. I met Johnny only once when um, here in the, in the summer of 1986, and he was playing a duo with a German jazz bassist, Peter Kowal. I don't know if you heard of him, if you know him. And that was in the jazz cellar in Frankfurt. And to me, it was my initiation into this music altogether because I saw Peter Kowalt as a German jazz musician and Johnny Diani as the South African exile here in, in Europe. And I, I saw these two cultural continents not clashing, but playing together and finding a way of communicating with each other that blew me away. And what blew me away mostly was afterwards, he sat down in the jazz cellar and he sat down at the piano. He played a song. I think it was a child, a children's song in Xochitl. And to me, that was just so amazing because he it showed me how much his roots were still intact and as a german uh, musician as a german person being born after the world war uh, having knowing that our our song our song tradition was completely abused by the nazis we could not refer to this kind of of um of a natural way of, of um, having something to do with your own musical roots. And this, having this jazz player, this free improvising musician being completely in tune with his German counterpart, and at the same time being so embedded in his own musical oral tradition, it, I, I felt uh, this was just a pure gift, a present to, to be in the presence of such a musician. So why in his scope? This doesn't say very much about his, well, it, I think it says much about his personality. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. That was beautiful. Thank you, Jürgen.
There's, there's one more question that I was hoping um, you could just look at. I mean, one of the amazing things is the longevity of your program, having lasted for 36 years. I mean, it's, it's really astounding. Maybe you can just ask Jürgen to describe, you know, what is the keys of this longevity also with respect to the cultural exchange, bringing so many different people together? Yeah, you know what? Do you want to ask, answer that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, because um, you have to write it in Yeah. Yeah? Or that you ask me. Or you have to write it in the language. Yeah, no. That's the first question. Yeah. Also, äh, warum hat das äh, auch so lange Bestand? Ich denke, das ist erstmal so, dass wir äh, nicht nur bei Tony sehen, beispielsweise auch bei Mohose und Lisa Lablet, dass wir einfach eine unglaublich gute ästhetische Basis gefunden haben in der Musik, aber eben auch in der Literatur, von Rufen zum Beispiel in die Wissenschaften oder in der Bibel, ist das ist von Ben, ben zu Malo, ja. da, da gab es unglaublich viel. Äh, he says, first of all, uh, it has something to do with the aesthetical basis um, of this project. That um, there's the compositions of Johnny, not just of Johnny, also of, of Louis Moholo. There is the um, poetical roots that, that Rusi contributed. So the aesthetical basis is very profound and very deeply rooted. So this is as far as the initiation of this project is concerned. Then it lies also on the fact that we have 36 years lang, denke ich, auch die besten Musiker gefunden haben, die diese Musik gespielt haben zusammen. Yeah, and then the second most important aspect is that uh, for the last 36 years that this project lasted, we um, have listened to the best musicians playing Johnny's music. So it's not just a very great aesthetical basis, but also the, the quality of the musicians who are playing this music. Also diese Musiker, zum Beispiel Christopher oder Daniel und Alan, die haben sich also wirklich auch angeboten, sie haben selbst gesagt, das interessiert uns, wir wollen diese Musik spielen. Und so kam auch der Kontakt zustande, dass wir sie in die Gruppe bekommen. Und ein sehr wichtiger Aspekt ist, dass Musiker wie Christopher, wie Alan und wie Daniel, sie selbst signalisieren, wir sind sehr stark interessiert in dieser Musik. Wir wollen mehr über die Musik lernen, die Musik ist Johnny ist. Und das ist ein sehr wichtiger und fruchtvoller Ansatz, wenn du willst, I mean, we, there was never a plan. We want to do it, it lasted for 36 years. It happened <laughs> because of all this uh, wonderful confluence of musicians being here, of the aesthetical material that, uh, and also of the public here in Frankfurt that knows what they are listening to. Yeah? They have been accustomed to this music and they love this music. They know um, what. They are listening to and they appreciate it. Uh, vielleicht noch ein Faktor, der auch wichtig war, uh, wir mussten ja auch unterstützt werden. Die Konzerte haben ja auch ein bisschen Geld gekostet. Und unsere Unterstützer, die denken auch in langen Fristen. Die haben nicht gesagt, uh, jetzt ist die Apache zu Ende in Südafrika und es interessiert dieses Projekt nicht mehr. Wir haben gesehen, uh, dass die Apache blieb in Deutschland, wenn die Jahre war gestorben. Niemand hat uns nach Südafrika geholt, also haben sie es unterstützt, leider, und zwar 36 Jahre lang. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, not the least is that uh, Kultur in Ghetto Jazz Against Apartheid has supporters, political and financial supporters, who are thinking in long terms. And they did not think that, well, 90, uh, Apartheid ended and now the support of this project has ended, but they, they saw the significance of this project and that the, um, the idea and the mission, so to say, of this project has not ended. Yeah? Apartheid has it ended in a, in a more um, general way than just the political system. Um, so this is why the support of um, people and institutions who support a jazz against apartheid before apartheid and it is very important for the period after apartheid and the
Ja, das ging im Wesentlichen für die Gründe. Ich habe nur ein Beispiel, eine langfristige Unterstützung für uns, aber eben auch noch Südafrika, ist die deutsche Gewerkschaft in die Metall, die deutsche Metallgewerkschaft, die größte Gewerkschaft der Welt, aber sie ist eben auch ein Unterstützer, ein Partner der südafrikanischen Metallgewerkschaft, die wiederum die größte Gewerkschaft in Südafrika ist. Mm. And he says one example of our political support system is uh, the trade union IG Metall. It's the biggest union in the world. Uh, and IG Metall has a long history of supporting the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa as well. So, so their support was very crucial to the longevity of this project. Und all das ist natürlich wichtig, weil es ja aus meiner Sicht darum geht, eben auch ein kulturelles Gedächtnis aufzubauen. Ein solches Gedächtnis haben wir vielleicht ein bisschen in Europa über die Jahrhunderte gesammelt, aber in, in den Kolonialzeiten, in den Apartheidzeiten wurde das natürlich zerstört in Südafrika. Und das muss dringend wieder aufgebaut werden. Und dazu braucht es natürlich ein langfristiges Denken. Mhm. And thinking in long terms for you, um, he says, it is very important if you want to build up and construct a cultural memory. And this cultural memory is um, needs um, this long support and it needs long term thinking in order to not just be, be rooted in Germany, but also the works and the, the creations that have uh, been achieved here in exile when it needs to be uh, to come home to south africa this uh, cultural memory um, building up and constructing it that's part of this <laughs> special mission if you will. Um, a beispiel for from us frankfurt we have here in frankfurt seit einigen jahren eine Ausstellung, eine Dauerausstellung, Exil 1933 bis 1945. Das ist natürlich eine hervorragende Möglichkeit, sich dieses kulturellen Gedächtnisses zu ermächtigen. Und so etwas müsste auch in Südafrika entstehen. And um, giving an example of what he means by building up a cultural memory, um, he quotes. Um, Here we have a national library in Frankfurt and it has a permanent exhibition called um, Exile and it refers to the period of the Nazi regime 1933 till 1945 and it shows the destinies of people who had to go into exile during those 12 years and what happened afterwards and for him this is a good example of building up a cultural memory And he says he could think about this for South Africa as well, valuing the contributions of those who were in exile during the apartheid uh, regime. So this is um, what he, he thinks about um, longevity of cultural economies. Okay, Stuart, do you want to take on over again? Yes, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, Vusi's uh, really applauding you here, um, saying thank you so much to Jürgen. What beautiful words. I think maybe at this point we can hand over to Daniel. Yes, and can I ask this question? Why he thinks, Daniel, why do you think? Um, what, is, what are the explanations for the longevity of this project? I think we will come to this point. You don't uh, want to answer this right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So how did you, oh, Christopher, we don't hear you. Yeah, at this moment, unfortunately, I have to say goodbye, but I want to thank everybody for making this possible. And it's it's really great. And I would have loved to, to be there. I hope to meet you all in person soon. This is a, just a great, uh, super exciting um, meeting and very informative. Thank you all so much and see you next time. See you, Christopher. Bye-bye. Have a good time. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. So we're okay. handing over to Daniel. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's correct.
That's very good. Daniel, you're not going to start with the longevity. Yeah. Uh, I can't. No, just, yeah, we, I can. But, uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, I mean, there are, there are different aspects what, what I think. One is that Jürgen and Elisabeth, they actually, this band is the only band where the band leader is not a musician or not part of the performing musicians. So Jürgen is putting it together all the time and uh, he he looks for the 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 concerts and he looks for the uh, what we need the support and all that stuff it's very well organized by elizabeth and jürgen so the musicians are in a very comfortable situation it's more comfortable than most of the works i do somehow so that's one of the reasons probably why well, there is another reason. I mean, since of course, so, some of the musicians, they passed away during the time, like John and Harry. So they are no more part of the whole thing, but I can't remember somebody just left the band. So, it's uh, everybody likes to come back. And, and so we work together for a long time and we, we are getting friends also during that time. So this is another aspect why. And then there is the, the curiosity and the, the fact that we can play this music, which is great for us. So we like to do it and then there is the thing that it's not like doing the same thing all over again. Every year we met once a year or once all, all twi two years. So it's one week a year and that's it. Or it's two years and just one week. So we don't have the time to get on our nerves. <laughs> there is no... <laughs> Thing like that and uh, um, also it's a we, we progress we we don't when we meet again after some time it will be a little bit different than it was last time and next time it will be different again so it's not boring and it's a, a great experience so that's what I can say to that. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, maybe you can uh, give us a little uh, introduction to how, how you came to join Jazz Against Apartheid and what was your experience in terms of um, the musicians you played with? I mean, were you mentored into uh, your role at Jazz Against Apartheid? Yeah, um, I think it was, uh, I was at that time, it was in the early 90s. Uh, I was playing with a bass player called Jürgen Wuchno, and he was very interested in Johnny's music. And uh, I think he was also in that workshop where Christopher was. I don't know, because I was not there. But he, uh, I played in his group, and he played his own compositions that were very influenced by Johnny's work. They had somehow the same uh, thinking, you know, this the bass line and then the second melody on top of that. And he also had this, these compositions. He, was, he did write them down, but it was maybe three lines or half of a page maximum. So somehow he he took something from Johnny and also we played Johnny's tunes some of them not maybe three four so uh, Jürgen had Jürgen uh, not Jürgen 
he was with Jürgen Hofner, but Jürgen Leinhaus had the idea to bring two bands he knew together. And the other band was the band in the early uh, early uh, state of um, Chase Against Apartheid. And that was Harry Beckett, John, Mac John Chikai, Makayan Tsoko, and Ernest, the bass player. So uh, he brought these two bands together and I was just in that band. I didn't know why. I had no idea. And then uh, Jürgen Wuchner was later no more in this band. But um, uh, I forget the name of our bass player. Anyway, later it will come. Um, and I was in that band and I didn't know why. And I just didn't say no. <laughs> that's that's what happened. And of course, the uh, with the mentor, the the people that mentored me was were John, Harry, and Makaya. The the ones that uh, came from the Diani's band, and there I had the probably a very. Uh, similar experience than Christopher Dell just was talking about. They showed me through their playing and being what is right, what is wrong, what I should do. And of course, uh, there was some talking, but the most of it was through playing, where I just learned how I act in the music, what what works, what doesn't work, what is like maybe right thinking, but wrong. <laughs> and, you know, things like that. And uh, I remember one little story that was very, very special for me. I remember it was John and Harry, they were talking about... Uh, a composition in the rehearsal and they it was like we do it that way no we do it that way no we do it that way it was you know going back and forward and uh, after a while they found uh, agreement how we do it and in the concert they did it different so so what happened is the the agreement was that there should be no agreement somehow <laughs> or or it's good to make an agreement and don't stay with it or what you can look at it in different ways but this is something i remember and because i was i was not used to that if you do an agreement and you discuss it for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, there must be a reason, <laughs> but it was that way. And so, uh, but most of the most, for example, Makaya, the person, he doesn't talk too much. And I mean, he talks, but not, not about music. He talks more about things in the music, about the, the spirit and on all that team. And, you know, for example, there was a uh, composition, UDF. And I asked them because there is the beginning is boom, boom, beep, boom, 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 boom. So the question was, is does it start one, two, three, four, boom, boom, bop? Or does it start one, two, boom, boom, bop, two? what is the right way when I write it down? And he said, oh, I think we played it that way and that way. <laughs> so he, he, he didn't tell me, write it down in that way or in that way. Just choose a way, it's okay. <laughs> and, you know, that was, that was, another little story and uh so yeah and 
But Makaya, I mean, through his playing, he he told me so much about about music. And for example, he's very sweet in a way. He's always there, very straight, but also it's never hitting. He's never he he's so a sweet person and he's a sweet player, a strong but sweet. So that was a lesson, for example, and there are many examples, but uh, mainly through the playing. No, I see. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. And what about um, your approach as an artistic director to these compositions? I mean, what approach have you taken mm -hmm. to, to bring out the essence of the compositions? Yeah, yeah. There, uh, some of the things that Christopher said is is. I see it in the same way. I mean, there is uh, there is the compositions. Most of them are a bass line, which could be an ostinato, or it could be another a melody, a little melody. His his bass lines are very melodic often, and so it's it's a melody you can say if it repeats the melody gets an ostinato and then there is another melody which is from the horns played from the horns and the fact that also christopher mentioned that um there is no harmony instrument in in the in the all his early works it's just horns drums and bass and uh, but the, the 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 two melodies they make a harmony. Out of the two melodies, there is a harmony coming, and you can say, okay, this is this harmony. You can say it's just two notes, and sometimes even these two notes give uh, give you a question mark because, like in in in. Uh, portrait of Bosa, there is this bass line, and then there is the melody. The bass line has a certain, if you want to say, harmonic structure in a way. You can say it's a, a seven chord with a fourth and a flat nine. And then the melody goes in, is another kind of uh, harmonic situation. It's just major. And the they the two they clash in a way, if you think normally, if you think like this should be like that, this should be like that. So it's wrong in a way, but then if you think more, it's very it's B tonal, so it's very complicated in a way. It sounds simple, but it it's not. And then this also gives the the possibility to interpret it, the, the harmonic situation in different ways. And you can hear that in, in, in uh, a lot of the solos from the horn players, that they use a different kind of harmonic background for the solo. It's not just one. They, it can go to different uh, places. So when I think uh, of the, the, the compositions, um, I, I, I try to, to see that and try that we are, as a group, are using it in that context. So that's the, the musical thing. And uh, if there, the stronger impact should be also like success or something like that, it's difficult. I mean, there, I think important is that uh, also Johnny's music is based on the, on the musicians that play with him. So he has like a strong, horn players, strong drums.
drummer and he doesn't uh, like um, he gives the freedom to be what you are so this and because if you have a melody um, for example like this is a little melody and it's not uh, something very sophisticated sophisticated it's not complicated it's but if you play it like an idiot it sounds like an idiot melody but if you play it with a lot of what you you what you, with you with your whole experience with your whole heart with what you know about music then this melody is great so this is a big part and he was always looking for uh, players that are able to bring this out and so this is very important that uh, everybody can be himself and then the, the second thing is as a band we we should we we should have a face we should have a sound we should have a an output that is more or less less unique in a way because we don't we are not in a museum we are doing living music so uh this part of and and there the, the, the difficulty here is that the 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 work i like most in johnny diani's music is always small groups it's mostly four piece two horns drums bass and uh so the each personality is very highlighted because it's only four if you have six seven seven eight nine ten people it's getting more complicated in a way and then if you if we all already have here in in europe we we play with more than four so the question is what do we, are you doing with the other four you know if we are eight it's four too much so <laughs> uh yeah and this is uh something i think about and and how i can connect these two things so that the meaning of what it is stays the meaning and it just stays if the personality comes out because without that it's it doesn't make sense to me yes so so daniel in south africa we're going to have a g about 10. um how is your approach uh, to the ranging arranging of this music i mean how is that being able to bring out the best uh, you know and the voice of the yeah music, yeah first of all we will see <laughs> but um i i i think that the, the main thing is have these two lines which is the bass line and the melody line and don't destroy that thing with too much around it so that's that's one of the thoughts i have uh and then, of course, there is there are situations in tunes where you can say uh, the hum because arranging has to do with harmony, or you can add other melodies. That would be another approach, which I didn't go. I I I I, I just took the two things or three, whatever it is and uh edit some some chords to it and sometimes i edit the the chords I, you just think they are obvious they are there but sometimes 
I, I, I said, okay, it could be also this, and then there is a little bit more tension to it or whatever, but try to, to, to leave the, the, the song as it is. Yes, I see. Just a final question from me, Daniel, and that's some, um, you know, the music and the message. And we, yeah. we see that we see that certainly with the song titles um, that he's used, but yeah, um, yeah. that message is not really conveyed much through lyrics. I'm just wondering, you know, how how do they you convey that message of uh, liberation through the actual playing of the music? Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, the way I see it is, uh, if you compose or you play good music. This has a, a very spiritual aspect to me. So during the time when you uh, compose or when you play or when you listen, also there is this is a spiritual thing. If it's good, I mean, there can be blah, blah, blah. But in this case, it's no blah, blah, blah. And it's, this is getting even stronger when you play live. I mean, it's a difference if you listen to a CD or if you are in a in the situation where it just happens at that moment. So this spiritual aspect has nothing to do with uh, the message, for example, about uh, uh, Angolian cry, for example. I mean, the tie, and then there is something else, which is the your personal life, your personal experience, your personal uh, fears, or whatever. I mean, it could be, and it's diff diff different with everybody. Nobody can, has shares the same experience, exactly the same. So, for example, when I compose, it's uh, I compose without any thoughts about whatever. After the composition is finished, I look at it and I ask, what is it? And I find a name which comes from my personal experience. So I, I think there is the one side where you have the personal life and then you, you say, okay, this music is called Portrait of Mosa or this music is called UDF or whatever. And maybe he had the thought I wasn't there when he did it, but maybe he, he did it the same. He was playing bass and he had an idea. And then he said, okay, this is a nice tune. What is it? Okay, I will, this is a possibility. Maybe he was different than I am. Maybe he said, okay, I play, I make a music that is called Angolian Cry. And then he started to find out how a Angolian Cry sounds. But I don't think so. I don't think so. And then, you know, this is, uh, there is an example that came to my mind. Um, there are two songs that reflect the situation of black people in the US for me very much. One is called Alabama by John Coltrane. And this tune is incredibly spiritual and incredibly strong. And just the fact that you know what happened in Alabama, that they shoot, I don't know how many people at that day, is the reason why he called it Alabama, because it, it happened in that time when he was composing this music. So when I hear this music, the fact that this happened comes to my mind. And of course, 
give me certain feelings in a way. And then there is another tune, uh, it's, it's sung by uh, Billy Holiday, it's called Strange Fruit, which is also a terrible story. And there you have lyrics. But somehow, it's not different in a way of, of what happens in your head when you know the both titles and you hear this music and this music. It's, it's just because it's different. I mean, it's different songs and so on. But the, the, and I'm, I'm sure that the title is very important to the listener if he wants to get to know more about the music, more about the background of the person. But this is not the spiritual side of the music. There it doesn't matter somehow. So that's how I see it. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. I wonder if anybody else has a question at this stage uh, for Daniel. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's not a question, more of a comment, especially on the last part. You know, thank you very much for your, for your input, uh, Daniel. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, you will stick to what you guys um, rehearse so that you have an agreement when you go on stage, at least everyone is on the same page. <laughs> but I get, I get a sense that, uh, People like Lex can agree to, especially um, the late uh, Zim Nawana, you know, that uh, many musicians will rehearse and rehearse days on end with him. And then on the last day of the performance, you know, the music changes slightly from what was rehearsed. So I guess those were the early innovators, people like Johnny Gianni, you know, to say that music is a movement, it must be a constant, you know, and element of surprise, but, everyone is not caught by surprise. They still continue and play the music. But uh, on, on this last part on Alabama that you had mentioned, you know, we had, um, you know, um, Dorothy Masuka as well in South Africa, you know, um, who have delivered the very early protest songs. We had someone like um, Eric Nomvete who had captured, um, a scene where people were killed and maimed in the Eastern Trans Sky, which is a part of where we are. And obviously, Johnny Gianni through the album and the song Miko. Um, for me, then I guess then that that's why it really binds um, this uh, movement, Jazz Against Apartheid, because it's not just for show or commerce, it's something deeper, you know, it's something more spiritual that binds people of the world against injustice. So it might not be about apartheid today, but it might be injustice committed elsewhere in the world. And maybe that's what keeps this project and this movement alive today. So I thought that maybe I must just raise that, that we might be talking about sustainability, but maybe it's a spirit sustaining the music because there's still so much injustice in the world today that we live in. And this project serves perhaps as a living reminder that, you know, we must all rise against injustice and say no to it. And maybe it's not apartheid today. Um, uh, not, not, not that we, we're benefiting from what is called the end of apartheid, because we're still feeling, feeling the ghost of apartheid is still with us, you know. But uh, around the world, there's just so much injustice. So I thought maybe I must just say my two cents worth about that. And yeah, um, and I'm still fascinated uh, about what we're able to do. And uh, I feel very sorry that uh, Professor Nomfundo Luswazi was not able to join us because she lived in Germany for many years and in Frankfurt and interacted with you guys there and was part of this movement, perhaps as a supporter herself, but as someone who was also mobilizing the anti-apartheid movement. She is in East London, where I, I am as well. And hopefully when you guys get here, you will be able to meet with her and maybe connect. And maybe you can talk on camera about your experiences back then, because this archive, this memory 
is important for generations to come. Thanks. Um, I would like to say something to uh, Daniel. Thank you for your input, you know, and uh, Jürgen and Elizabeth. And all that I want to say is, I mean, the story you're telling here and your input to this is actually a, a testament as to a true sense of what uh, improvising musicians do. Yes, we agree on things and then we get on the stage. As long as we still keep the integrity of the music, the integrity of the compositions of the, the, the composer, that music will live on. And uh, like you said, we're not playing like a museum type of music. We're playing music that is alive and living. And Johnny himself as well, from reading from his stuff, one of the reasons why he always liked to play with different people from different backgrounds is that he always liked and wanted that sense that everybody bring their experience into the music, you know. I mean, like myself, when I'm composing, I don't say, uh, like, I've got a song that I call a hello, you know, and, and this song, it's a, it's a simple Bakanga type thing, but I didn't have a title when, when, when I composed it. But after that, then I thought, okay, so this song, ah, then I've got a friend, I've got a friend, this friend of mine, we can call him now. If he answers the phone, he never says hello. He said, <laughs> uh, hello. So I said, oh, okay, this, it reminds me of him, you know, so I said, hey, hello, you know. So, so I'm hoping that um, when we're meeting and, and we're putting life to this music of Johnny, we won't forget our personalities behind as long as we stick to the integrity of Johnny Johnny. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would also like to add something on to uh, what you mentioned, Daniel. Um, thank you so much for your great input, uh, Jürgen and Elizabeth, and also to you, Daniel. Um, John again also mentions an aspect of improvisation and he coins the term foul run. So in the aspect of uh, uh, you mentioning that specific scene of uh, uh, him always uh, of pop musicians uh, um, improvising, whereas they had uh, uh, practiced something else. So I think it's something that perhaps Tatukiani had always been uh, uh, reflective of in terms of his compositional style as well, in terms of his improvisation and just the, uh, the uh, openness of uh, improvisation for musicians on his bandstand as well. And I'd also like to add perhaps a question to you, Daniel. Um, in your experience as well, uh, uh, what, do you think the exile experience or perhaps the bandstand of Uu Tatukiani played in terms of creating a new sound? Yeah, I think this, uh, you know, uh, as far as I know, uh, in the time when he was still in, a, in South Africa, he played with this band called the Blue Notes. And uh, if you look at this music, it's much less uh, personal in a way than what he did later. So probably the experience of meeting people in exile, uh, I mean, some of them were coming with him and he still played with them, but he met other other people from other continents, from other 
background from totally different kind of things that that came into his music. Since he was an open person, he didn't stick to only to the things that he brought with him from South Africa. So it was a, 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 a coming together of different things. And uh, I think he was always interested in what other people are doing and learning something from it. So uh, I think the, the exiles part of that is, is important. Maybe it, you don't know, but if he, if he would have been all his life in South Africa, the music would have been different. I'm sure about that. And uh, yeah, there was a part I forgot in your question, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and also, uh, and also, oh, OK. Go no, you can it. answer. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> No, I was just adding on to what Daniel said and uh, uh, saying uh, he answered basically most of the question, the parts that I asked. You can also add on, Brelix. Okay. Uh, what was I going? Oh, 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 the other thing is, uh, I mean, Johnny, Johnny, his, when he left, when he left South Africa, of course, he was very young. I mean, he was about 15, 16, around there. And, and he had just started playing, you know. So, so really his development is from whatever stuff that he absorbed when he was still young. I mean, they started, he, almost all these musicians uh, started by singing, you know. I mean, Johnny even say, if you can't sing, then it's going to be very difficult to, to do the thing. So uh, I would say he's, uh, he's dead and Bambisa's prodigy because Udete, they had a band, uh, the, the, the four youngs. And then he had a brother, his brother who fed, they had a band with Abojoni, which was called the junior four youngs. So, so Udjoni, Moved from that junior four yanks and joined the the bigger the bigger band, and then the story as it goes, uh, he was fiddling with the bass in some hall where they playing, you know, and for his age, you know, I'm told that he was getting a very very beautiful big sound, and I can tell you from a bass player's point of view. That instrument can be, can be intimidating and it can keep quiet when it wants to. But Johnny could make it speak. Johnny could make it speak at that young age. So, 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 so there's definitely, there's definitely, Johnny had a flair for that, for that instrument. He was born to be a bass player, I would say, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and uh, so he just moved on. And also, uh, all this singing, all this, I mean, for me, when I'm listening to Johnny's music, he went through phases, you know, he was angry, he was nostalgic, he was a revolutionary, he was, I can hear all of that in his different uh, phases of his, of his music, you know, and, uh, and uh, I mean, we can't really pinpoint him and say, no, 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 he was here. You know, he sort of played the whole spectrum of this uh, music. And I have great, great respect for that man. You know, I wish I had met him. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like the fact that you also mentioned uh, uh, the part that he was a singer as well, as initially that's where his musicianship started, him singing. Yeah in the Boogie yeah. Brothers with my late father. So um, as well, um, I think in one of his albums, if I'm not sure, I'm not sure which one particularly, 
he also plays the piano. And I think on, it was a Willisau Jazz Festival where he sings and also plays the keys. So in terms of mentioning just the broader spectrum of his musicianships, his musicianship, it's quite broad and it articulates him as a, a, a musician who wants to know sure. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that piano, thanks to Tete Mbambisa's mom, because that's where they, they were all fiddler, fiddling around with the piano. No, thanks, Lex. I just want to welcome Claude. Claude, you, are you with us? Hi, them? guys. Hi, Claude. Hi, hi there. Hi. Mulu uh, hey, Sorry. Hi, Claude. Lex. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Sorry, uh, as you can see, I'm in school uniform. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've just, I've just, yeah, just finished one lesson, and the next one's going to start soon. I will catch up sure. with everything, but it's good to hear everybody else. So okay. go, go, go where you were. Could I add okay. something because it um, refers to your situation at school, Claude? I would like to ask Daniel one more question, and it has something to do with allowing mistakes. Daniel, yesterday in our conversation, you said something which I found very important. It has something to do with taking risks, allowing mistakes, and learning. Could you elaborate on that as far as Johnny's music is concerned? Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, there is, there is, uh, I think I already said something about that. I mean, it's about you taking, you taking a lot of risk and, but this is the, the only way where you can progress in a way. And if you don't do it, you will stay the same idiot you have been always <laughs> um, could i could I ask a question of claude before you go back to school claude <laughs> okay so I threw it. no uh, they were asking for a portrait of johnny diani i, I believe uh, you met johnny and i know of course you performed with louis and could you could you give us an idea of uh, you know who we're speaking about Okay, the first the first time my, my first professional gig, um, I was what, nineteen was with Johnny Dudu and Lewis. Um, it blew, blew my mind. It took me a few years to get over it. But what I learned from all of those guys was that if you don't step out onto the road, you won't see the traffic coming, and you got to be sharp enough to be able to step back. But the beauty thing, beauty about music is the traffic that's coming won't kill you. It can only make you stronger. Um, I the last few times I saw jo jo Johnny play, in fact, it was and Makaya was in the band. It was a gig for Brad Julian at uh, the Africa Center, and Johnny was actually playing piano, not even bass at all. Um, and uh, you. you you have to respect for those guys because if you think of where they came from, it was oppression, suppression, depression, but they were yet brave enough to step into the road and say, no, this is what we're going to do. They didn't just stay and play bebop. They, they were ready to expand and open boundaries. And that you, in fact, you see that even stronger if you just look at Thomas Gianni. You know, Thomas does, doesn't just play one thing. He's prepared to open up and try anything that's there. And that nuclear energy within you is really what drives any artist. Rather than playing safe, step out. The earth is not going to open up and swallow you. Um, I, I suppose on short notice, that's, that's, that's the most important thing I think should apply for any artist, whichever field you are in is take a chance. Um, I teach my kids, I say, they always go, oh, sir, but I might get it wrong. I say, well, get it wrong in this room so that when you go out, you can know that, hey, I got that wrong before. 
let's get it wrong better this time. Yeah. And 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 I think that <laughs> you know it's got that's got to it, we've got to instill that in. I teach in school, especially for me, especially in schools. I've got to instill that in kids and to say, "Go on, take a chance, take a chance." No, nobody's going to knock you down. For sure, Claude, a trumpeter's question. You know, um, there's mm. some of the greatest trumpeters here, Mongezi Fez and and Don yeah. Cherry, for example. You yeah. know, what I mean. How, how is it as approach? How is your approach as a trumpeter to playing this music? You know, in the line of these greats. Well, they they for for me they set the standard to be open, to be free, to go and take a chance. Um, so one thing that and this is not from the, actually this is from Dizzy Gillespie. All Dizzy twice I've met him, and all he said to me was, "Get your sound," and if you have a sound, you have a voice, and from uh, uh, Mong Mongezi and Don Cherry, Lester Bowie, they showed me to be free. And if you have a sound and you are free, there's nobody can take that away from you. It will be your identity. And if you have an identity, you can speak in any language. People will understand you. Yeah, for sure. Did, did you play alongside Harry Beckett uh, in the Jazz Against the Apartheid? And, and I mean, how could you... Explain his his character and those experiences. Harry Beckett is my teacher. And people say, yeah, but he's been dead. He's still my teacher. In fact, I've got his trumpet. I'm going to actually, one of his trumpets I bought when he died, I bought from the family. And I'm going to actually give it to Chris McGregor's son, Kai, who's, who's playing trumpet in the Brotherhood. And they've got a gig coming up on the 17th. We are in PE, of course. But... All, all, all those guys, Harry again had a complete voice that was his. Um, there's nobody sounds like Beckett, and and Harry's the one who brought me into JAA. And he just I said to Harry, but Harry, I don't want to. It's it's your gig. He says, no, but it's your sound. And he <laughs> he, 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 he he again he taught me that from. I remember, and he, he used to make a joke about it. The first lesson I went to have with him, I was in a pair of shorts and I was playing cornet. And he always he used to say to me, uh, 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 uh. I remember when he came as a kid. <laughs> but it was, it was, it was, it was, it was that thing. Like, Be free to try. Because if you don't try, you won't know. Sure. I mean, a good example is if you don't know what Mboko is, until you've tasted it, you won't know what it is. Nobody can explain it to you. You must taste sure. it. And I'm not very fond of sour milk, but I've tried it. And I now know what it is. And you, you must be prepared. You must be, as an artist, first prepared to push boundaries, but to, more importantly, take chances. Because you will never know the, the, where the boundary ends unless you pushed it there and you've taken a chance to push it to that extent. Sure. For sure, Claude. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, what about the meeting of uh, South African jazz and, and European jazz? I mean, how do you find uh, that these two have come together and what kind of effect has uh, South African jazz and these musicians you've spoken about had on changing European jazz? Um, I suppose the thing is, I think, well, a lot. It's the only way. It's the best way to describe it. But but they they when they came to when when the uh, the Blue Notes came over, um, initially they bebop was. If you listen to Ted Bratab's playing, it was all bah, swing, bang, ding, 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 ding. but then there was this whole free movement growing which came from the Americans, but there was a free movement and they, they got onto that only because they had an advantage because all of that stuff comes through oppression and depression. And they, they were there. And I think they, they embraced it, but were able to push it further. And again, push the boundaries to the point that people like Evan Parker and Keith Tippett, they were like, no, that's what we want to do. Yes, 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 we can hear where that's going. And it wasn't the American <laughs> influence that, that made them do it. It was 
wait a minute, it's not only the Americans. Yes, 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 there is something. And I think that opened up a whole new chapter of music in Europe because it gave Europe a chance to say, wait a minute, there is a European jazz scene too that is big. And a lot of that came through with the free stuff. And it, it the, the, the events happened so that they were all flowing at the same time. And which made, I suppose, made it, made the transition or made the flow a little smoother, but they, they, still, they still had to work at it, like any, instru- any, any musician on any instrument. I see. Claude, one of the things I believe, and the South African musicians can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that um, we still have a long way to go in terms of um, being a professional at an international standard. I just wonder with your experience of the South African guys who came there, did you find it, even yourself, did you find that professionalism was something you had to develop and learn? Is it something we need to develop more? Um, yes and no. Uh, professionalism, and especially in England, is very much regarded as, if you've been to music college, you're a professional. And that's something I fought and I said, no, I'm sorry, for me, it was not that. Because we had musicians who never went to school but they, 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 the yearning they had, the burning they had, the need they felt to speak in the, with, with the voice they had was important. And I think that is, that is professionalism rather than the musicologist churning out 100 kids a year who all sound the same. Uh, so I would be careful to try and say our kids or our young people should go study music. No, you, sh- you should go live music. It would be the best way to express yourself rather than learning it from a book. I'm not saying learning it from a book is wrong or is not the full thing, but I think learning by experience is a stronger way of achieving what you, because the, you really will know not to play that note again. Or if I'm gonna play that note again, I better make it so sweet that you're going to say that note's a beautiful note and that you can only get from doing it. Um, so in that sense, I would, st- I would almost curb people from going to college to learn improvise music. Go and do it. Get your trumpet and go and find every single pub there is a band playing and just ask, can I sit in? Which is what I did. Um, I mean, my parents were ashamed when I left college and I went, I I can't do this. I can't do this because they're implying that you must do this, this, this to get there. And I knew lots of musicians who played and never learned in the academic sense. So there there is a lot to be said for community based ensembles. And that is something I do a lot. I work with kids uh, in London with two youth youth orchestras. And it's kids from the community rather than kids from the college that I think turn me on more because the ones who come from the college come with, oh, I know that. Whereas the ones who come from the community say, oh, say that again. Oh, hold on, how does that go? How do, oh, oh, ah, I didn't know that. Hey, can you do that fingering on there? Whoa. They are more inquisitive rather than being knowledgeable. And I'd sooner work with somebody who's inquisitive than somebody who's knowledgeable. Sure, no, brilliant. Thanks, Claude. One last question from me is, um, you know, the relationship between jazz against apartheid and humanity. I I wonder, um, you know, is there a consciousness amongst uh, the musicians to develop this uh, underlying humanity to the music? I mean, one example could be, um, you know, the multicultural approach, playing with so many musicians from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And how do we how do we engage this approach and develop this approach, particularly here in South Africa? There's only one way to do that is to first accept that music is a universal language. And the minute you speak the universal language, color barriers, class barriers, uh, financial status all goes out the window. Um, uh, you will find somebody who's got a, a really battered instrument 
and play something that you go, woo! It's because they love the instrument. And you will find less discrimination or oppression in music with that value or any art with that love for the art. Because nobody needs to impress anybody else other than through your horn. I've got a question here from Vusi. The question is the meaning of homecoming, bringing this experience to the Eastern Cape. So, I mean, what to you is, is the meaning of the homecoming? For me, the homecoming is whenever you play music that affects people, and here comes my next student. Whenever, whenever you play music that affects people to such a way that they don't want to leave you. It's, it's, what, it's what it's got to be. Um, I mean, actually, <laughs> Lewis said it once to me, he says, when you get to a place and a lot of the people look like you, you know you're home. But, and that is it for me with the music. The minute you play, play, and it's not a style, you play with the energy and you play with people who have that same energy, you are home. And, and again, th th there is no racial barrier that can be put to that. It's an energy that you feel in somebody's playing and you just go, yeah, yeah, we like, I like, let's do more. And it will always do that with you. No, thanks so much, Claude, for, for giving us time. I know you've got to go to school now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's right here. <laughs> in fact, oh, okay, my, one of my so... people's... Yeah, one of my pupils coming in right now is uh, a Nigerian girl. In fact, I have more uh, I have more girls playing horns, Muslim girls. Uh, for me, it's just like I, I, I love it. The this you know when they do Remembrance Day, and they do the last post da 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 da. This year I couldn't do it in my school because I was uh, teaching at a different school, but I had three girls playing it, and they were there on the stage with a little hajibis on. I was, the, the teacher showed me that I'll get, try and get a picture so I'd send it to you. For me, that was the proudest moment. Two, three Muslim girls with their little hajib hair all covered playing the last pose. And I was like, yes, yes. We, we, and that's what it needs to be. And finally, uh, the, the consensus just came out in England. It's only 28% of the people in Britain now regard themselves as Christians. <laughs> you know, so things, th things are changing so fast. But when, when, when I had my, and I called them my Hajibi girls, when I had them playing the last post, it was just, yeah, yeah, we've arrived. We are changing, we are changing the outlook. We're changing the landscape because the landscape is changing. Hmm. Thanks. Anyone else got a question for Claude before he goes? I it's don't so know the well. lottery numbers. <laughs> before you ask. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm also getting over a, a, a terrible chest infection that I had over the weekend. But other than that, everything is good. No, thanks, Claude. I think uh, we're going to hand over to Alan now. I know Alan's been hey. uh, for some time. I've been awake. Like Alan. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah, it's now, uh, well, it's now 6.30 in the morning here. I've been on since 4.30. It's been wonderful. <laughs> no, good to see you. Good to see everyone, actually. No, no, thanks, Alan. Uh, I think it's good for you to tell us um, uh, about uh, being fresh. And, and I know you called it uh, a, new, a new musical approach. Uh, when you joined JAA, maybe you can just describe a little bit how you joined in, in this new musical. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm from Canada here, Edmonton, and we're very steeped in the traditional jazz music. I was always drawn to people like Albert Mangelsdorf and sort of a more freer approach to music. The first time I heard him, and he's a Frankfurter, I got to meet him when I lived there. I was amazed, you know, uh, I was more of a classical trained or self-taught actually, but more in that style, just real precise precision, knowing what you're doing at all times. And I heard Albert who was knowing what he was doing, but it was so free and open. <clears throat> and I was drawn to the European music scene. 
at a young age. Uh, and when I finally got a chance to go over there with a, a Juno nominated band at the Canadian Grammys, I really tried to explore some of that. And how I joined, I was, I moved back to Germany. I was on tour in Germany with Cats, Phantom, Chicago, big musicals touring all over. But I would always, any town I went to, I'd always find the jazz clubs. And I don't know if I met Daniel in Frankfurt at, in the night, early 90s, but I was hanging out a lot at some of the clubs. <clears throat> and then we moved back in 1997. And uh, I met Daniel there at a jam session in Darmstadt. And Jürgen Wuchner, who we talked about earlier, heard me play. And they said, you know, we'd like you to join this project. And I said, sure. And then I show up to the rehearsal. or the, Basically, we had a rehearsal in a concert, I think. And there was John Chikai. Harry Beckett, Makai Onshoko, and I thought, oh my God, because 10 years earlier, I had played at the Montreal Jazz Festival and Pierre Dorje New Jungle Ensemble was playing. And I heard these guys and I saw Harry Beckett and John Chikai. I had no idea who they were. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And 10 years almost to the day later, I'm in Frankfurt in Darmstadt playing with them. And how does that happen, right? It's just... Uh, you know, clean living, healthy eating, and being in the right place at the right time. And so uh, Daniel mentioned Jürgen Wuchner, that was a great influence. And as all the fellows alluded to, it's just um, being open, being in the right place at the right time, and, and just really being appreciative and curious. And so I thank Jürgen and Daniel for the opportunity. Oh, and Chris Dell was there, of course, as well. And so that's how I came into the music. I didn't know very much about Diani's music at the time, uh, but I certainly learned a lot. And, and that's how I joined. And like, like Daniel said, it's been um, a celebration of friendship, of music, of spirit, of creativity, of exploration, and just deep respect for all of us. Uh, you know, what doesn't matter where we come from, what color we are, who we, what we play, as long as we bring all that and we have to it, that speaks volumes to, to the music, to the longevity and the, the sustainability of this project. So that's how I joined and, uh, and I'm just still to this day uh, amazed and thankful that those little synchronicities of meeting Jurgen and Daniel at the right time and spending the night in the parking lot because I couldn't get out. They locked the car, the doors on the lock. So after the jam session and that just just domino effect into I had many, many years in Europe and I go back to play with this project every two years as long as I can. You bet. No, thanks, Alan. In terms of um, you said you came into this music new, I just want to get an idea. I mean, how did this music affect you and this uh, collaboration with um, Daniel and the guys you spoke of, how did this affect you, bring change to, you, to your approach? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I, I was always a, a student of creativity and call it free jazz or improvisational music, but um, to play, especially with the masters and Claude and Daniel don't take offense, but to play with people like John Chikai and Harry, who I'd never heard that approach to the music, Harry's especially, and John's, it really affected me. And it gave me the, um, the energy and the courage to follow my own voice of taking chances and creativity. <clears throat> Where I come from here in Edmonton, there's very few, there were at the time, very few opportunities to do that. If you played outside the changes or you tried to play free in that, you were looked down upon, you know. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's cold here. We try to stay inside the box. It's minus 20 right now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's so in, in meeting the fellows and in playing the music, especially like Chris Dell alluded to earlier, that ostinato, that restricted harmonic background enables you to, to explore and just, just create in many, many ways. You can take chances, you can superimpose harmonies, you can superimpose rhythms on that static yet creative background. And so that really changed my approach to, and now when I'm, I'm here or I'm anywhere, I may be playing a bebop tune or through some tune. I have the courage and the capacity to take it out and bring it back in. And that's what playing with those masters and this kind of music has brought to my music and my compositions and my conducting of jazz ensembles. There's a, a real creativity and freedom there that I've been blessed to be associated with and keep developing over all these years. 
Well, thanks, Ellen. I want to pick up on a quote uh, you sent in the email there where you said, performing with these musicians has deeply affected my musicianship and humanity. Now, can you give us some examples, maybe some of the characters and how, you know, what, what it was that affected your humanity so deeply? Well, you know, from Canada here, our, our struggles, especially from my generation and my background, are nothing compared to even our Indigenous, uh, our marginalized and racialized people here like that. But especially meeting meeting people like, uh, we did play with Louis Moholo, you know, and Micaiah and John and, and, uh, and Harry and Claude and all of that. It just gave me an insight into the, 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 the world that I was hearing about and seeing on television, but never had a firsthand experience with. And to hear, I'll never forget Daniel, you may remember, but Lewis and Makaya were in the back, we were getting ready for a concert and Lewis was holding court and he was saying, you know, look at me, look at Makaya, he's so pretty and so beautiful. And when we were kids and just these stories and this interaction and this deep love they had for each other and for all of us uh, really, really gave me an insight into how they overcame how you have all overcome these oppressive and horrible conditions with a sense of humanity and caring and love and embracing and inclusivity. And I was just sitting there going, oh my, this is amazing. This is wonderful. And I'm blessed and honored to be a part of this. And whenever we meet, like, like Daniel said, we meet every two years in that, and it's, there's a brotherhood there. Uh, and the music has brought that together and we have maintained it. And so that has really affected. And, you know, I'm at an age now, I'm, I'm getting older as we all are. And uh, it has also taught me or uh, to, to not take anything and any experience for granted with anyone I meet from any background in any situation. And that has deepened my, my sense of appreciation for everyone and wherever they may be in their lives and wherever they, wherever they have come from. I work, I'm, I'm a manager of a huge festival here in Edmonton in the middle of winter. We have 60,000 people in three nights. Uh, so I manage the whole thing. It's an expression of indigenous, which are Indian culture, uh, Francophone, which I am partly, and our Métis cultures. And it's a blending of that. And my experience through this project has really enabled me to deeply reach out and, and try to understand uh, struggles of cultures and an appreciation of culture is not my own, yet we are all one. So that's that's what that has really affected me. And, and, and I reflect upon it every time I play and especially every time I play this music. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Alan. Maybe uh, you can just comment on the composition and the approach of Diani because he's also mixing the South African folk music and the experience of collaboration in Germany. I mean, is there this in mix mixture between indigenous and jazz? I mean, does this come across to you? Absolutely. You know, when people say back here, you know, what uh, what what is this project? Well, I tell them it's. I said it's a, it's basically a, a, a synthesis, collaboration, and ex exploration of almost folkloric tunes and structures and melodies with a free improvisational approach. And I said, it's, it, it gives a sense of history and meaning, yet a sense of forward thinking and incredible exploration at the same time. And that, when we're up there playing, like Daniel alluded to, some of these melodies and harmonies are very simple. They're folkloric, as we all, all of our cultures have that in our folk music. And you have that continuum of this incredible historical sense of place and time and this possibility of exploration and development together, moving together through this. And, you know, I'm from a part of Canada. If you ever want to take a look, there's nobody here. <laughs> Alberta, we have 5 million people where, where Germany fits into only half of us. We have, and what I'm getting to is in our compositions as well, there's a sense of vista and horizon and landscape that when I first heard Johnny's music, and that kind of music, uh, um, Abdullah Ibrahim and, and you know Dollar Brand and that, I just felt this expanse, this expanding of place and time through the music. And it resonated with me as a Western Canadian or a Canadian because we have nothing but space and time here. 
<laughs> so, so that's, uh, I don't know if that answered the question, but that, that, that really is, and still we play a lot of the same music and it changes all the time. There's that deep respect and understanding or trying to understand where it came from, Johnny's story and the story of South Africa. And yet we're bringing our contemporary abilities of expression on our individual instruments to the music. And I think that sort of catapults it. And I know we mentioned earlier, you know that the public, I have seen the reactions of folks wherever we play, it's a visceral emotion and release to the music we play, particularly when we're, we're taking chances and developing tension through a, an incredibly creative approach to it, you know, a free jazz approach. It just creates this, this, this building of, of tension and of expression and then the release. And we've all expressed at the audience at times, you know, it's different than playing Scrapple from the Apple or something. People don't scream and yell and jump around after the song ends. With this music, people often do. It's a visceral and a deep, profound connection. And- uh, Well, for sure. Thank you, Alan, that's brilliant. You mentioned um, the term on the fly to describe the way you approach um, the ex your expression on, on this music. I just wonder, I mean, how can this term be used, you know, in the mentorship and, and helping others approach this music? I mean, on the fly. Yeah, you know, I've as a trombonist, everything is stressful. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's such a hard instrument to play. <laughs> you know, Daniel and Claude wiggle their fingers a little bit and everything comes out. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so <laughs> as we all know, uh, no. So it's uh, it, what I mean by on the fly is oftentimes, you know, when we have this, this arrangement and like Daniel alluded to earlier, there's discussions about how to play. And then as soon as you get on the stage, it changes. I did some concerts and I was blessed. Uh, John Chikai enjoyed playing with me. So he asked me to do some concerts with them, you know, and I thought, holy smokes. So we'd go to the concert and this, I'm getting to on the fly and we'd show up and there's no music. It was a quintet. I can't remember the drummer, Daniel, some, some guy from Sweden. I can't remember. Anyways, I'm thinking, oh, geez, now what? On the fly is right. John would look, I'm, he's much taller than me. I'm about, you know, five, six. He would look down at me with his beautiful voice. He says, Al, what do you have tonight? I said, Geez, John, I don't know, what do you got? And he started playing and 45 minutes later, we'd open our eyes and that was the end of the first set. <laughs> and that was on the fly. That was incredible learning. And with our tunes and arrangements and the way we play them, if someone's playing a solo, what I meant by on the fly was it's in the moment. It's the spontaneous connecting with others. Uh, and Daniel and I may play a background. And I think for students, this, they have to, a big part of this is that this kind of music is the most democratic music in the world, in a sense that we're working together, we're playing together, yet it's the most soloistic music as well, because you're taking solos. So it's this beautiful combination, this dance, ebb and flow. And I would, I think what we'll talk about, or what we do, is how do you create like a background or a, a, a riff behind the soloist or something on the fly, or how do you create a harmony in the moment? And I think that's something that this music enables us to do rather than other kinds of jazz music or creative music. This really has the possibility for us to do that and to develop that. And that's where, you know, I've been with the project, what, since 1997, and it always feels new because we're always coming up with different approaches to it not necessarily melodically, we're trying to play true to the music, but especially if we're playing some backgrounds or we're coming up with some other things back there to keep it interesting and fresh and to try to contribute to the soloists in a sense. So that's what I meant by on the fly. And, and I think students need to learn this, need to, to not learn, but to be open to it and to understand what it's about. And it's not just anything. You have to react to what the soloist is doing, what the harmonics are at the time, what the rhythm is at the time. And that comes from doing it over quite a period of time. And that's where I learned so much from Chikai. Makaya in his subtle brilliance, his understated power, uh, and Harry Beckett with his sheer creativity. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alan.
Um, I believe uh, you're also a vocalist. Um, I know you haven't spoken about that yet, but uh, <clears throat> earlier Lex was speaking about um, Johnny's uh, origins as a, as a vocalist himself, starting as a singer, the power of the voice and music. I just wonder as a vocalist, I mean, could you comment on his compositional approach or maybe his, his bass lines or from a vocalist perspective, do you see him as a singer? Can you point that out? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, a song like do 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 do. You know, they're all beautiful, beautiful melodies, and that was the first thing that struck me. Maybe uh, even even uh, yeah, appear. All of those are singable, and that's the first thing that struck me. You know, knowing a bit of the the history of the of the music that the choirs, you know, in all cultures, voices first, right? What I tell my students when I do workshops, and then I says. There's three basic things in music, you know, or, and I said, first is rhythm, right? Whack. Next is melody. Whack on your neighbor's head. Ah, right. And then only years later comes harmony. So melody is important. And the voice, voice was proto speech, right? Voice was everything. So I hear a lot of voice in there. I know that John, Daniel, correct me, John Chikai sometimes would do some, some voice work in, in some of the concerts we did, you know, sing some melodies. We may do that. I hope we do some of that in, in the concerts we're doing. But absolutely, you hear the voice, you hear that aspect of his, his creativity in all the music. No, well, thanks so much. Uh, I think at this stage, it's pretty much, uh, we finished, it's now, it's now an open discussion. I think there's just one more thing we need to comment on and it's quite surprising, but in South Africa, uh, Diani is regarded as a great unsung hero. And I know you've speak about all these guys, mm -hmm. John Chikai, Harry Beckett, um, Makai and Shoko as well. And it just seems like there are so many unsung heroes um, actually. So I just wonder, you know, um, what, what role do we need to play to, to bring this legacy uh, home? Well, I think this is, I think this project is one of the biggest things we can do, you know. I've got a dear friend, a trumpet player here, Bob Tilsley, wonderful, wonderful trumpet player. And years ago, when I came back from Europe or when I would come back and forth and I mentioned, he says, oh yeah, Johnny Diani, man, he's amazing. So people like Bob, probably through the, 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 the involvement of Don Cherry in Johnny Diani's music, another trumpet player, know of it. But I, you know, I'd love to bring this project here, you know, let's, let's make people aware of what's going on and what had happened and what is what is carrying on you know and those heroes in many many respects i tell people here that this music isn't you know the um bebop based or it's not titles like t for two or whatever these titles mean and this is a deep meaning a, a music of meaning and of uh, of impact and those people i don't know what uh, many of them I'm, I'm learning and this is what's beauty about this but all of those people are heroes in many ways to the to the culture, to the music, to the society, and to uh, and you know to the diaspora and the exile. So I think the more awareness we can, I'm trying to line up some interviews here with our local cultural radio stations. I know they had someone who was in a great Canadian Bake Off, and I wrote a note and I said, you know, I'm part of this project. I think that's as as interesting as someone who can make good cinnamon buns. Nothing against cinnamon buns. So I'm I'm trying to get the word out here, and uh, I think that's how we can we can at least bring some awareness. Thanks, Ellen. I uh, think uh, Elizabeth uh, wants to make a few comments at the stage. Thank you, everyone. Uh, can I add something there? Just short. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there. You know the homecoming thing. I think one aspect that is maybe important, maybe it already happens, I don't know, maybe it already happens in South Africa, but there was this young kid going away, learning a lot of things, not from the South African culture, but from different people, from different backgrounds, whatever. And there is this situation where we in Europe kept that alive in a way and now we're going back to South Africa and maybe some of South African will see oh the music is different than we thought or it could be different maybe Lex can say more about that 
but I can imagine that something has been added and and this is important that the South Africans will see what has been added, what is a, a different approach also in the music of a South African person. Through, through the exile, yeah. Yes, and to me also, I think the homecoming um, doesn't just mean that the international jazz against apartheid musicians are coming home to South Africa. None of you have lived in South Africa. It's your first time. But um, what I find, and I'm very curious about that when I think about this reunion of the JIA International and the South African um, musicians meeting, is what will come out of this union, of this meeting? And how will you play together? And, and it's not just that you are coming and, and um, bringing the light, so to say, but you yourself in South Africa, you are contributing and you are also um, shaping the way that this music uh, will develop. So it's not just a contribution from here to there, but it's a cross-fertilization, I think, of, of mus musical experience. And this is what I'm really also very interested in, in hearing and in seeing how this comes together and what will come from, what will start from there. So homecoming in, in different di directions, in all possible directions, I think, I hope. <laughs> So, and then I think we should say goodbye to Jürgen. He has to leave now. I don't know how much longer we will stay together, uh, but Jürgen, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I, I think Vusi is asking, um, the South Africans are on the call. Um, uh, they've all gone except for, for Lex. So I think, yeah, we'd have to hand over to Lex. Uh, all, the, all the young guys on the call have left Chester and Sakina. Mm -hmm. So Lex, uh, I think it's, um, Daniel was asking that question of you. I mean, in terms of the music, what it picks up in, in Europe, uh, if you wanted to just comment on that. Sorry, what was the question again? What was the question again? I I I was talking about uh, that a, a young person from South Africa went to Europe and he did yeah. experiences that were outside the tradition of South African music, and it affected of course johnny the artist composing and his playing and whatever and mm -hmm. then the question is how was that recognized in south africa will that homecoming whatever it is be mm -hmm. something that will surprise people or will will it be something that they already know or did they you know what I mean? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know what I mean. Uh, I think I think it will do both. You know, it will do both. Uh, there is a little bit of something that they know, uh, like for instance, songs like uh, "Tribute to Tete Mbambisa." You know, I mean, and uh, and songs like there are some songs that has got that has got that has got a uh, some form of uh, <laughs> some mpakanga, some quela some kind of and also and also johnny has has in most instances referred to himself as a folk musician so so all these folks elements they are elements that 
we still have yet yeah, that we're developing and what. And of course, it will definitely uh, be a surprise that Tony had money to incorporate so much of our stuff into his music, you know. And also the other thing, uh, there's always been there's always been a uh, uh, with the lack of the right where the crossover with I mean, like uh, Claude had said at some point. I think you've said it too that these guys the Blue Note, when they left here, they were hardcore, hard pop kind of musician, you know? So there's always been that American underlying kind of thing happening. And then when they went over, which is why they were confident enough when they get, when they got over there to say, no man, I mean, there are stories that uh, Nick Moyake told, told uh, Wayne Shorter that, man, whatever you're doing, I was doing that when I was back home, you know? So, 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 so you're not, don't come and try and think that you're giving me anything new, you know? And the story, uh, I like the story of Johnny and, and Mingus. I mean, they were big rivals. At the same time, they were good friends, I think, because uh, there is a story that, uh, Johnny went and asked to jam in or play in when uh, Mingas was playing at Ronnie Scott or something. And people were nervous because Mingas was famous for hitting on other guys and stuff. And, and Johnny was a small guy, you know, and Mingas was big. And I'm sure Mingas was taken by a shock too. Hey, who is this guy that is, you know, uh, doesn't, doesn't he know who I am? And Apparently, Mingas asked him if, do you read music? And Johnny said, no, I don't. And then Mingas said, I do. And Johnny said, oh, good for you. <laughs> and then, you know, and also after the playing, Mingas said, said, uh, look, nice playing, man, but you play a little sharp. And Johnny said, well, you play a little flat. So, so Johnny was a very confident, confident guy, you know. So there will be, hence I'm saying there will be both of those uh, things. Yeah, I hope I've answered your question. Thanks, Lex. I see Claude has come on, on the chat to say he wants to respond. Claude, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm back. I'm, Alan, I'm having to keep my trombone player at bay at the moment. And she's, she, 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 she I'll, I'll just, you, and I, I know this is completely illegal. Here she is. Hey. Uh, she, uh, she, she, she's looking at me, sir, you can't do that. <laughs> she's Wonderful. never going to give, she's never going to forgive me for that. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah you're right, sir. You can hear. I, I'm audio now. Be careful what you say, Zainab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one of my, one of my, what I call, as I call, told you about her already. I've spoken about you, Zainab. Yes, I have, Zainab. So quiet. Ah, you see these pupils we have these days. Um, what, what, what I wanted to say about the, the whole crossover, regarded as crossover, is that because of oppression, suppression, and oppression, we developed an, a lot. We had trad in South Africa. We had Dixieland. We had, we had, in fact, in South Africa was the only place that had the I Stedford, which is a big Welsh singing competition. It only happened in Wales and in South Africa, nowhere else. But because of oppression and the Welsh were also very oppressed people well, because they were under the English, but we won't go into that now because there's no English in the room, it's a case enough. Um, uh, with all the oppression, suppression, will tend to bring out people's need to express themselves. Um, people were very, uh, are very amazed when they say, oh, my, oh, you guys did Trad or you did Dixieland. And it's yes, because we had limited instruments like they had, the Trad had, like all of that stuff that happened in New Orleans, Second Line, all of that. It was limited church-based or brass band based instruments that they had to work with. 
But the feel that came through was a feel for liberation. And in both senses, in both countries, or both cultures, I should say, rather than countries, um, the, the need to express themselves was the same. So it, there was no nothing new for us in South Africa when you heard the early Ellingtons. There were early Ellington pieces being played. I mean, my, my father is a trombone player um, and he didn't read. And he gave up playing because he said, hey, they started bringing our charts and, and we called it orchestration. He says, I just couldn't. But until then it was, you play by ear. You get to know your instrument and you know where you want to play that third. Oh, you got to go from that position, from four to three. You know where it is, but that can only happen when you have mastered your instrument. And so all the styles like Dixieland, they were there in South Africa. So when, as, as Bralex was saying, you know, Johnny said to yeah, yeah, we, we have that. You know, it's nothing new. I'll give you just a quick example. Um, the first uh, tour that the British Council did that was not the Viva La Black. Viva La Black was the first British Council tour to go back to South Africa. The next one I went back with Andy Shepherd. I remember we got off the got off the plane and we got into the bus. Uh, everything is packed, and the driver put on Kinda Blue. So he's driving, and as he was driving, I was sitting with Steve Lauder. The guy he sang every single note on the album, including the bass solo. <laughs> so, so Steve Lott is now looking at this guy going, uh, oh, sorry, so you're a musician? He goes, no, I'm your driver. Uh, and so everybody's like, yeah, you're the driver. We don't want to be horrible, but you just sang a bass solo. You know, you, you sang everything. And he said, well, yeah, I know the whole album. And I said, well, that's it. When we do take on music, we take on all of it. It's not just the melody. Uh, another example is the reason South African harmony is, is world famous is because we sing not in a harmony that is written for you. You take the harmony that makes your voice the richest. So not everybody sings the melody. No, not every there's, there's so much so, such a thick layer of harmony inside. You take the one that best suits your voice, and that was what makes South African music really rich. And that can only come from having a wide experience of oppression, I suppose I could say. So the, the crossover is, is is not a crossover, it's a more a learning together rather than a crossover. Sure. Sure. 